Welcome to our first lecture on the nervous system. We got a brand new topic, brand new system. We are done with the integumentary system. We are done with the skeletal system. And we are about to spend a whole lot of time on the nervous system. All right. One big job of the nervous system, if you had to sum it up in a single word, one big job the nervous system has is to control. The nervous system is going to control things in your body, all in the grand scheme of that favorite thing of ours, homeostasis. And the nervous system is controlling organs, like that beautiful liver right there, tissues, like this renal tubule in the kidney, and cells, like this macrophage up here. But, before we get into the how and why of the nervous system, and how it does this, we got to pick up on a fact here. The nervous system is not the only control system. The other control system is the endocrine system. So the first thing we're going to do is kind of like compare and contrast these guys a little bit, see how they differ, see how they're similar, and then we'll dive in and go through the nervous system. So that is our plan. Sounds good, right? All right. Well, let's do it. Let's get going. Okay. A couple things about the nervous system and the endocrine system. Both of them are control systems, okay? Both of them have the goal of maintaining homeostasis, of responding to stimuli and fixing things. However, the manner in which they do it is going to differ. The nervous system is going to use a combo of electrical signals and chemical signals. So it's going to use electrical signals and chemical signals. There are two kinds of electrical signals we're going to learn about. One's called the graded potential, and the other is called the action potential. Just off the top of your head, which do you think is more awesome, more fast, and more fantastic? Graded potential or action potential? If you said action potential, you are absolutely correct. So, oh, nervous system uses electrical signals, graded potentials, and action potentials. Plus, they'll use chemical signals. And the chemical signals used by the nervous system are known as neurotransmitters. In contrast, the endocrine system is only going to rely on chemical signals. They travel via the blood, and they are known as hormones. Okay, because of the fact that much of our signaling in the nervous system is done electrically, the nervous system, its responses are going to be very quick. The response is fast. Now, the endocrine system on the other side is going to be slower. Well, think about it. If my... Let's name an endocrine gland here. Let's say my pituitary gland was going to release some growth hormone. Well, that growth hormone has to travel through the blood to the heart, to the lungs, to the heart, and then onward to the target tissues. That takes time. The nervous system, with nerves and neurons extending throughout the body, the fact that they can use electricity in their signals is going to be much faster. So nervous system kind of wins that one, right? But the nervous system's responses are often very short-lived. They're not of long duration. Whereas the endocrine system has longer-lasting responses. So as you can tell, this is a, they're going to basically like complement one another very, very well. Okay, cool. We're done our comparison and contrasting here. We're done with the endocrine system for a while. You'll do the endocrine system again when you get on to AMP2. When you take AMP2, maybe next semester, whenever you take it, maybe you take a semester off. That's always good. Um, maybe you'll take AMP2 with me. Maybe you'll take it with another instructor. I hope not. I like you guys. Better if you take it with me. All right. So what are some basic things the nervous system does? Three basic jobs. Sensory input, 
integration and motor output. Sensory input means we are taking information. So we're taking information, information about our body and also information about our environment. I'm just going to abbreviate that env. So sensory input is taking info about our body and our environment and sending it to our CNS. We haven't defined CNS yet. It's a central nervous system, which as you can probably tell, includes this beautiful wrinkly thing right here, the brain. So we take information to the brain or to the spinal cord. In other words, to the central nervous system. And then step two, the second job of the nervous system, is to process that info. And that job of processing that information, we call that integration. So the processing of the information is called integration. And your brain and your spinal cord, in other words, your central nervous system, they are the integrators. Then we're gonna send commands out. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to send commands out. We're going to send commands, like in this case, to a skeletal muscle. More generally, commands are going to go to effectors. So like skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands. So these are the three basic jobs. Take information in. That's called sensory input, process of information, that's called integration, and then send commands out to effectors, and that's called motor output. And those effectors could be any of our three muscle types or even glands. Hey, by the way, does this basic pathway remind you of anything we've studied this semester? Because it should. It should remind you of that basic homeostatic feedback loop where we had the afferent path, which is basically what sensory input is, then control center, which is basically what integration is, then the efferent path, which is basically what the motor output is. So, great deal of similarity there. All right, wonderful. Let's talk about that breakdown of the nervous system. We can break down our nervous system first into two big parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system, or you'll see me abbreviate it CNS a lot, is going to be the brain and its inferior neighbor, the spinal cord. So spinal cord, which we see right here, and the brain, which we see down here. Now, where are these guys? The brain, of course, is in the cranial cavity. Uh, brain's in the cranial cavity. The spinal cord, of course, is in the vertebral cavity. So I want you to notice and pick up on the fact that the central nervous system is very well protected with these two cavities housing these two organs. And of course, remember the combo of these two organs, cranial cavity plus vertebral cavity gives us the DBC. The brain is straight out of the DBC, well, the central nervous system is. The dorsal body cavity. Anything that's not in the DBC, in other words, anything outside the CNS is going to be part of your peripheral nervous system. So outside the DBC, it's peripheral nervous system. And when we're talking peripheral nervous system, we're talking nerves. Nerves are bundles of neurons, basically. And there are two kinds of nerves. Cranial nerves. And I see some cranial nerves coming out of the brain right there. Right there, right there, all these guys, all these guys down here as well. Don't worry, by the way. We are going to learn the names and functions and unique facts about all the cranial nerves. There are, in fact, 12 pairs of them. Okay. 
Also, coming out of the spinal cord, we got spinal nerves. So all these guys over here on the right-hand side of our screen, spinal nerves. There are going to be 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Bad news for you guys. We are not doing all 31 pairs. Sorry about that. Maybe later on in your further education, your further schooling, you may take a real anatomy class where you do all the spinal nerves. I know what you're thinking. You're like, wait, this is not a real anatomy class. This is like anatomy light, what we're doing right now. I'm kind of serious. It's kind of just it's kind of upsetting to hear that, right? But yeah. All right. No more messing around. Let's keep on going. Let's keep on going, guys. Everybody with me? All right. Okay. We can further divide our peripheral nervous system into two parts. There is the sensory afferent part. Neurons bring in information into the CNS. That's why we have afferent, because we're going towards something, towards the CNS. Sensory, because we're taking information from a sensory cell, sensory organ, something like that. So sensory afferent neurons going in. Motor efferent neurons going out, so away from the CNS. My mnemonic device that I always keep handy is the word same. Sensory afferent, motor efferent. Okay, a couple more things about this. Another mnemonic device I like to use is the word sad. How does this class make you feel? Does it make you feel sad or happy or neither? Anyhow, makes me happy. What we got right here is a sad baby, just to drive home the, the idea of sadness. And here's the thing. My sensory neurons, my sensory neurons are going to be afferent, meaning they're going towards the spinal cord, and they're going to be dorsal, meaning they go into the back of the spinal cord. So when I'm talking about my PNS, I'm going to have sensory neurons. They're going to be afferent towards the spinal cord, and they're going to be dorsal. They go into the back. Like this blue guy right here, this blue neuron pictured right here, he's taking information this way towards the cord. So he's sensory and afferent, and he's going into the back half. This is the back of the spinal cord. So, my motor neurons, my motor neurons, they are going to be efferent and they are going to be ventral. If you want another mnemonic device for the spinal cord and these neurons, you can use the name Dave. Sensory afferent, ventral efferent. You can talk about Dave and say, hey, that's the, that's the Dave I know. It's the same Dave. Sensory afferent, motor efferent, dorsal afferent, ventral efferent. Okay. Let's look at the brain, because this, this sad mnemonic was applicable to the spinal cord. The brain is kind of different. We don't use to get to use the sad mnemonic device because of the way the neurons are set up. Got all these cranial nerves here. Some of the cranial nerves are totally motor, meaning they're only going in for, taking information out. Some of the cranial nerves are totally sensory, meaning they're only taking information in. And others are a mix, so they're taking information in and out. Again, later on, when we're doing the cranial nerves, we will do all of this. All right. Let's keep going because we can take half the peripheral nervous system. Remember, peripheral nervous system, PNS. We just talked about dividing the PNS into a sensory afferent division and a motor efferent division. The motor efferent division can be divided into two parts itself. One's called the somatic nervous system. So we get the SNS. 
and one's called the autonomic nervous system, the ANS. And the difference between these two is where these neurons are going, what kind of effector they're going to. Somatic nervous system neurons, the effector they're going to is good old skeletal muscle, which we see on this muscular gentleman right here. So if the effector is skeletal muscle, then we're using our somatic nervous system to stimulate it, to take the command to it. And this branch of our nervous system is considered to be mostly voluntary. I mean, think about it. To get your muscles to move, you generally have to tell them. You have to send a signal to them and say, hey, muscles, do something, right? Excuse me. I just yawned right there. My bad. I'm putting myself to sleep with this anatomy lecture. That's not a good sign. I can only imagine how you guys are feeling right now. Anyway, have that cup of coffee. Do some jumping jacks. And we'll keep on going. Let's see here. Where was I? Oh, yeah. So the, these two branches differ on the effector we're going to. Somatic nervous system goes to skeletal muscle. The autonomic nervous system goes to cardiac muscle, like we have in our heart here. Smooth muscle, like we have in our urinary bladder right here. And also, I don't have it written down here. Let's add it into glands. And this branch is involuntary. You don't control these muscles. You don't control glands. If we look at the words, the word autonomic, auto means self, nomic means governing. So self-governing. The somatic nervous system, the word soma, the soma part of this, means body. So what are we doing? We're controlling our body. Skeletal muscles move the body. Okay, almost done with this classification scheme. We can then take our autonomic nervous system and divide it into two types of neurons. There's going to be one type that are called sympathetic and one type called parasympathetic. And they differ in what, of, what effect they have on their target tissue, like what they do to cardiac muscle, for example, what they do to smooth muscle. And they've got great nicknames. The parasympathetic is called the rest and digest system. The sympathetic is called the fight or flight system. Let's say that you were being chased by this green mamba, very poisonous snake right there, and you're running away. I love this dude's running form, that straight leg, that arm, that wrist. It's fantastically interesting, the artwork here. This act would require the turning on of your, your fight or flight system, your sympathetic system. And what would happen to your heart? Your heart rate would go up. Your blood pressure would go up. Your pupils would widen and dilate. Those are all sympathetic responses. Whereas if you were just chilling after a meal and taking a nap here, that's what he's doing. He's not dead. He's taking a nap. Digestive activity would increase. Breathing rate would slow down. Pupils would constrict. Those are all parasympathetic responses. I know you're hungry for more on this topic, but we're actually going to spend a whole unit doing the autonomic nervous system later on down the road. All right. Let's go. Cool. We're done with big divisions. We are moving on to the cells that we see in nervous tissue. And there are two varieties. There are neurons and there are glial cells. There are over 100 billion neurons in your body. Over 100 billion. That is a crazy big number. Cannot imagine how big that number is. Not 100,000, not 100 million, but 100 billion. Such a big number. That's why you're so smart. You get all those neurons. And neurons are supported by supporting cells called glial cells. Sometimes they're just called glia 
Sometimes they're called neuroglia. And you actually have even more glial cells than you do neurons. I mean, you can just see, look how many glial cells there are. There's so many glial cells. All these nuclei we see here are of glial cells, and there's so many. This guy, this big dude right here, is a neuron. He doesn't even fit in the, the, the picture here. He's so big, his extensions are going out so long. A neuron, by the way, could easily be a meter long. That's really long for a human cell. Crazy long. All right, these are my two basic types. Let's talk about them some more. What do they do? If you know the three basic functions of the nervous system, you know the three basic functions of neurons. Sensory input, integration, and motor output. We defined those already. I'm defining them here for you again, but we already did that. So those are my basic functions of neurons. We're going to go over the structure of a neuron shortly, okay? Before we get to that, though, we're going to spend a brief amount of time with glial cells. There are a total of six types of glial cells. There are six types of glial cells, six kinds of glia. And you may say, but hey, Professor, we only got four right here. That's because there are four in the CNS, which means the other two must be in the PNS. Let's talk about them ever so briefly. The four basic types, and I see them here. One kind is the ependymal cell. One kind is the astrocyte. Then the oligodendrocyte. And last but not least, the microglia. All these guys are in your CNS, your brain, your cord. There's a pair of neurons here as well. Now, this is the brain what we're looking at right here. I just pointed at the screen with my finger as if you could see me pointing. Sorry about that. Anywho, in your brain, you actually have cavities. There are four big cavities in your brain. This is one up here, this tan area. Cavities in your brain are called ventricles. You may have heard of ventricles in the heart. There's also ventricles in the brain. And the ventricles are filled with fluid which is called cerebrospinal fluid, often abbreviated as CSF. That fluid has got to move. And it is going to be moved by these extensions right here on these cells. You can see all these guys. I know you know what these things are because we saw these things in the trachea. You're right. Shout it out. There's the first letter. I'll give you both consonants. And now I'll fill in the vowel. They're cilia. And the ciliated cells are these ependymal cells. They line cavities in your brain and your cord. And the cilia sweep, and the sweeping cilia moves CSF. All right. But there's more. Let's not just do the ependymal cells. Let's do some more, too. There are microglia as well. Microglia is really how you pronounce it. They're small, so they're microglia. They are phagocytes. They are going to do phagocytosis. What does that mean? They're swallowing either foreign microbes or dead or broken bits of cells. They're kind of like the immune cells of your nervous system. And then we got this astrocyte right here. Astro means star. This is a star cell. He was called a star cell because of his many appendages radiating away from him. And he does a lot. He physically supports neurons. Physically supports neurons. He helps them grow. He is going to be involved in kind of like buffering the chemicals around neurons. Plus, he sticks his feet, look at his feet right here. He sticks his feet on capillaries and he forms something called the triple B, the blood brain barrier. Blood brain barrier. The blood brain barrier is going to prevent 
bad things, toxins, poisons, etc., in the blood from getting into your brain tissue. This is important. Okay, we just knocked out three of these guys. Who's next? The oligodendrocyte. Oligo. Many. Dendro branches. Cyte cells. The cell with many branches. And we see his many branches here. All right, what this guy is doing is he's sticking out some arms and his hands are wrapping around a part of a neuron called an axon. And recall for a minute that neurons use electrical signals. Those electrical signals are going to travel along axons. Well, if you're using electrical signals, what do you need? What do you need if you're using electricity? I am holding the cord right now that's from my that's attaching my microphone, my headset to my computer. The cord is covered in rubber over the wires. Why? What's the purpose of that rubber? Insulation. We also have to electrically insulate our axons, which are sending action potentials, that awesome type of electrical signaling that we do. The oligodendrocytes help form this electrical insulation. The electrical insulation is also known as the myelin sheath, and it will surround our axons. Okay, so we got the basic four. Let's look at them again. I see an astrocyte supporting a neuron and forming the blood-brain barrier. I see a microglia about to phagocytize some microbes and cellular debris. I see some oligodendrocytes. There's an oligodendrocyte right there. He is sticking out some arms and then wrapping around the axon in order to electrically insulate it. I see this oligodendrocyte right here. He's actually doing two separate axons at the same time. That's one of the things these oligodendrocytes do. And here, I see a cross-section of the spinal cord. This is a cross-section, a transverse section of the spinal cord. And if you notice, there is a little hole right here. That little space right there is called the central canal. Guess what kind of fluid is in it? If you said CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, you are correct. And now, lining, lining that canal, there are going to be these cells right here. These guys really remind me of the tracheal epithelium. Hopefully, they remind you as well. And these are my ependymal cells. And what do I see on them? But right here, I see lots and lots of cilia which are going to sweep the CSF through the spaces in your brain and in your cord. All right. All right. Cool. Now let's do the PNS glial cells. So we did the four CNS ones. Let's do the two PNS glial cells. They are both pictured here. Two S's, we got the Schwann cells. I should ask you that in a test. Who discovered the Schwann cells? The answer is Mr. Schwann, Herr Schwann. Schwann cells are going to wrap around axons, but they're doing it in your PNS. So they are also forming that myelin sheath, that electrical insulation just like the oligodendrocytes did in the CNS. And then we got the satellite cells. Satellite cells basically sit on or near the main body of the neuron. They actually electrically insulate it. Plus they help transfer nutrients, wastes between the cell and its environment. So axons surrounded by Schwann cells, Cell bodies surrounded by satellite cells. That's in the PNS. All right. There we go. See an axon surrounding it right here. One axon will surround, sorry, 
We see a Schwann cell surrounding the axon here. One axon will... will uh, I can't say it in the right order. One Schwann cell will always surround a single axon. Whereas we'll get dendrocytes, their arms can grab onto different axons. Schwann cells don't do that. Okay. We are half an hour in. We're like a uh, quarter of the way done. Let's take a break. We'll call that we'll call that lecture number one. We'll pick up next time with the structure of a typical neuron. See you later.